Good day and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia and please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. It is my honor to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Andre Iremia, who is Assistant Professor at the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology at the University of Southern California. He completed his bachelor's degree in computer science and mathematics from Lipscomb University in 2002, followed by a master's degree in computer science from Vanderbilt University in 2004, and an MS and PhD in biophysics from Vanderbilt in 2007. He's completed postdoctoral fellowships at, uh, in brain mapping and neurophysiology at UC San Diego, as well as in multimodal neuroimaging at UCLA. And since, um, uh, uh, since, since that time, he's um, uh, been based now at uh, the, uh, both uh, uh, UCLA and at the University of Southern California. Dr. Irmia is a computational neuroscientist, neurogerontologist, biomedical engineering researcher, and biophysicist with interests covering a broad range of topics in neural injury, uh, uh, degeneration, plasticity, and repair. His research utilizes computational biological approaches and multimodal imaging to study how the brain connectivity alterations caused by insults to the brain contributes to connectome reorganization, to cognitive degeneration, and to recovery. He's published extensively on MR physics, anatomic structural theory, bioengineering, um, as well as inverse localization and human brain imaging. A key component of this research is trying to understand the relationship between brain injury, amyloid angiopathy, dementia, and how these conditions interact with one another. This focus includes vascular dimensions of neural degeneration and cognitive decline, as well as the interaction between cardiovascular health and brain atrophy. He's particularly interested in unique populations with atypical aging profiles, uh, similar to what we are gonna hear about today. Uh, his work is funded through grants from the National Institutes of Health, as well as from the Department of Defense. And his lecture today is entitled Brain Aging, Inflammation, and Cardiovascular Health, Insights from an Indigenous Pre-Industrial Society in South America. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you are watching via YouTube, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, We'd also like to uh, invite our specially selected 2021 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants to submit any questions that they have for Dr. Irmia via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of Dr. Irmia's lecture. And with that, welcome, Andre. We are really looking forward to your lecture. Good morning, Jack. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'd like to thank you and the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, at uh, this year's Innovation Lab. Um, and the topic of uh, my talk today uh, lies at the intersection of brain aging, neuroinflammation, vascular disease, and dementia. Uh, in industrialized societies like our own, uh, it turns out that dementia and vascular disease are a major cause of death. And as you can see on this slide, uh, if we tally up the causes uh, of death worldwide, uh, we find that nearly a third of them uh, are accounted for by vascular disease, whether cerebrovascular or cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and of the top 10 uh, causes of death uh, that are uh, um, known, uh, AD is the only one which cannot be prevented or cured. So obviously we have a, uh, an important mission to understand how Alzheimer's disease uh, interacts with, with the vascular component of brain function and structure. Uh, and there has been a lot of research and interest on relating cerebrovascular disease to cardiovascular disease and uh, to, uh, in understanding how uh, these two facets of uh, brain health are related to uh, cognitive impairment and how they can lead to uh, Alzheimer's disease down the road. Uh, one interesting uh, aspect about Alzheimer's disease is that there is an increasing uh, amount of interest in the question as to how our modern lifestyles might affect dementia risk. Uh, so we do not live the lives that our ancestors did. We have a very different industrialized society. 
Uh, we, uh, most uh, humans live in urbanized environments, and it's estimated that the percentage of uh, individuals living in uh, urban areas will increase dramatically throughout the 21st century. And with urbanized environments and modern lifestyles, come uh, air pollution, a sedentary lifestyle, unhealthy diets, especially in Western societies. And it is known that these factors affect cardiovascular health and perhaps even uh, brain health. And there's been uh, gathering evidence uh, to suggest this. Uh, and what prospective uh, studies have found is that there are significant associations between Alzheimer's disease, hypertension, uh, and obesity. And uh, it would be very interesting to know whether Alzheimer's disease uh, is a byproduct of modern environments, which uh, contain these environmental factors that are damaging to health, that are damaging to uh, uh, brain health and to the cardiovascular system. So to answer that question, we have to turn to populations that live traditional pre-industrial lifestyles uh, that are similar to those experienced in human prehistory. Now, unfortunately, there are very few uh, populations uh, that are like that left in the world today. There are very few uh, groups of people that have not been affected by uh, the modern uh, industrial, by the industrial revolution, first of all, and by the um, uh, technological advances that occurred after that in the past several centuries. Uh, there are very few people still left that live uh, traditional lifestyles that are um, similar to those experienced by humans uh, during uh, prehistory. And uh, however, uh, there is one, at least one such group that is uh, a very interesting uh, per, especially for that reason. And we have been studying that group for uh, quite a while. Uh, this is the uh, Chimane people of the Bolivian Amazon. So in the lowland regions of the Amazon, as you can see uh, here in this square highlights the area of Bolivia uh, where the Chimane people live, uh, have uh, this uh, pre-industrial lifestyle uh, that they have preserved to a remarkable extent. Uh, this is a population of about 16,000 people uh, who practice a traditional style of agriculture. They are hunter-gatherers and the horticulturalists. Uh, they live in the Bolivian Amazon uh, basin, and they have been studied by U.S. researchers for over 20 years. And um, I have been part of this collaboration uh, for the past uh, five years, and I would like to share with you today some of the insights that we have gained from the Chimane regarding uh, uh, cardiovascular health, inflammation, and how these factors affect uh, brain aging and potentially the risk for dementia. So the Chimane uh, health and Lifestyle Project got started uh, over 20 years ago, and uh, its aim is to study the Chimane people of Bolivia. The Chimane live a subsistence lifestyle. Uh, they do not have access to uh, uh, electricity, uh, modern, or any of the modern, uh, the staples of modern society that we are used to. They live in a very remote and inaccessible region of uh, the Bolivian uh, uh, Amazon basin. Uh, it is uh, they live in traditional uh, villages. Uh, they obtain their food either by hunting, uh, using bows and arrows. Uh, they practice uh, traditional forms of fishing and farming, and they carve pirogues, as you can see uh, uh, on the slide, out of uh, large trunks of trees that live in, uh, that uh, grow in the uh, Amazon. Uh, they have relatively quite little um, interaction with modern society because they, they are so remote from, um, from uh, our way of life uh, uh, geographically and, and their uh, region of the world is very inaccessible. Uh, so they have been largely unaffected by 
all the changes in diet uh, uh, and, and other factors that have um, uh, affected the humans for, uh, for hundreds of years now. Um, they are also uh, uh, not sub subject to uh, the same uh, air pollution that many uh, individuals in, in Western countries uh, are uh, subjected to. And so they live uh, in a, a very uh, pristine area of the world and their uh, uh, specific case uh, is a very unique one, and so they're they're very much worthy of our attention um, and investigation. The Chimane diet consists um, about 17% of protein, uh, of which about 10% uh, consists of game, uh, about 7% consists of fish. Uh, they uh, eat uh, mostly lean meat and fish. Uh, that come from animals and fish that live in the area of the world where they live. So there are peccaries, uh, uh, tapirs, capybaras, uh, monkeys uh, in that area of, uh, of the forest, and uh, piranha fish, as you can see, catfish uh, are a big staple of their, of their diet. Uh, they also eat a lot of fruits and vegetables that grow in their uh, uh, naturally in their in their region, uh, and they practice a uh, traditional form of agriculture. Uh, they grow some corn um, and um, a few other uh, vegetables and and plants that are uh, raised that are grown in a traditional way. Now, the Chumane Health and Lifestyle Project is a uh, international consortium uh, with. Uh, consisting of scientists from a wide variety of uh, disciplines, uh, gerontologists like myself, uh, uh, neuroimaging experts, anthropologists, uh, epidemiologists, biologists from uh, a number of, uh, of universities in the U.S., in, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, as well as from South America. Uh, and our aim is to study the Chimane people because we're interested in gaining insights that can help us to understand uh, the vascular, the causes of vascular disease, a neurovascular and cardiovascular disease, and dementia. And I will tell you in this talk why the Chimane are so interesting from this particular standpoint. Uh, what's shown is in this picture is the CT scanner that's located in the city of Trinidad, Bolivia, which is the closest uh, city with an imaging facility uh, uh, and that's uh, most proximal to the area of the world where, where the Chimane lives. Uh, there are, in, and in the past uh, 10, 15 years, the collaboration has scanned over uh, 15 to 1800 Chimane adults aged uh, 40 uh, or over who have been provided with transportation from their villages to the city of Trinidad, uh, which is a small city of about 30,000 30, people uh, located uh, uh, about eight hours drive from the closest place where the Chimane can be um, uh, provided tra trans land transportation. Um, and um, the city has a CT scanning facility uh, where uh, the Chimane are, uh, can be scanned. The, both, they uh, receive both uh, chest CT scans and uh, head uh, scans. Uh, the chest scans are used to quantify coronary artery calcium or CAC. And from uh, head scans, we uh, can quantify brain volume, as I will explain later. Uh, we also have extensive clinical and laboratory data that have been acquired uh, from the Chumane. Uh, there are genetic data, uh, bio, blood biomarkers of inflammation, uh, and, and other um, quantities that can be extracted from blood. Um, and this study has, from the, its very inception, uh, had the IRB approval of all the institutions in the U.S. that are involved. Uh, there's about six or seven of them, as well as from uh, the uh, Bolivian government 
and uh, we have local approval from the Chimane traditional councils, from the villages, and from the individuals themselves who participate in this collaboration. Uh, and, and here you can see uh, uh, on the left, this is a picture of myself a few years ago uh, in the area where the uh, Chimane live. Uh, we, uh, the uh, group tra travels there every year for campaigns to acquire data from, um, from the Chimane. Uh, lately, we haven't been able to do so because of the pandemic, but uh, we uh, anticipate resuming our work uh, there uh, after that. And here in the middle, you can see the, at the bottom, you can see the Amazon basin uh, with all its tributaries and the area shown with the circle is the area in, where uh, the Chimane live. So um, they live in the lowlands of Bolivia, uh, relatively low altitude. Uh, and this is an, a sample CT scan, chest CT scan from, uh, the Chimane, from a sample uh, a Chimane participant. So in terms of uh, lifestyle, the Chimane have a lifestyle quite different from our own, as you might expect. Uh, their levels of daily exercise uh, are much higher than in Western societies. So in the U.S., the mean number of average uh, number of steps per day taken by a U.S. individual is a bit over five or 6,000 steps in uh, the Chimane culture, uh, since they're so involved in um, fishing, uh, agriculture, uh, they're very involved in, in, with their environment uh, and obtaining uh, their uh, uh, necessities from the surrounding environment, they have, um, they're much more physically active. So uh, the average ch uh, Chimane female um, walk, uh, registers about 16,000 uh, steps per day. Uh, and they're a little bit, uh, they walk a little, maybe a, just a little under the uh, number, of, uh, number of steps that the Chivane males take because uh, they're more, in, more involved in cooking, taking care of children in the uh, villages, whereas the males um, walk more because they uh, they're more involved in, in fishing, in, in hunting, and so forth. And every family has to provide for itself. Uh, so the males of the family often go uh, every day or every other day on, on uh, if they go hunting or fishing, and uh, the, the females uh, are more involved with, with cooking and taking care of the children in, in the villages. Uh, and when we look by age category, and not, uh, as you can see here, uh, we see that um, there is also a, a sustained um, level of daily uh, physical exercise throughout the lifespan of the Chimane. So even individuals, uh, as you can see here on the right, who are in their uh, 60s or older than their 60s, still maintain a high level of daily physical exercise. Um, and this is, this is uh, po possibly quite significant for uh, some of the unusual demographics and uh, epidemiological um, findings that, uh, uh, that have been uh, reported in the Chimane. Uh, now, there has been quite a bit of study on how physical activity predicts mortality. And we know that there is a direct relationship between physical activity and decreases in, in all-cause mortality. Uh, this is from a study published uh, uh, almost 10 years ago in The Lancet in a uh, Taiwanese population. And we, if we look at, um, on the x-axis, we have activity levels from inactive to very active. And on the y-axis, we have the hazard ratio for various causes of mortality. And uh, for all causes, we see that there's a, a fairly linear relationship uh, where uh, physical exercise is protective against all-cause mortality. It is also protective against cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, and, and diabetes. So, so this has been established. Uh, it's been known for a long time. 
And uh, as you might expect, uh, physical exercise is probably uh, going to affect the, the chimane uh, quite a bit. Now, uh, from the same study, there's, it's also been seen that uh, the mortality reduction associated with exercise, with increasing levels of exercise, uh, is dependent on uh, the intensity of physical exercise. So uh, the most vigorous uh, type of exercise leads to um, a greater reduction in uh, mortality with, uh, um, despite engaging in such exercise for shorter periods of time. Uh, so, for example, we can achieve a, about a 45% reduction in all-cause mortality with 50 minutes of vigorous daily physical exercise, uh, but uh, with uh, more moderate exercise, uh, more time, more uh, daily exercise is, uh, is needed to uh, achieve comparable levels of mortality reduction. Uh, so in terms of dietary intake, the team has analyzed uh, uh, the diet of the Shimane, and what has been found is that uh, uh, their diet differs quite a bit from the traditional American diet. Uh, carbohydrates in the U.S. form about on average 50% of the American diet. In the Shimane, they, they're about two-thirds of their diet. Uh, what's very interesting is that whereas in the U.S., uh, fat intake is about uh, 34% uh, total, including about 11% saturated fat and 2 or 3% trans fats. In the Chimane, uh, all, uh, there's only about 16% fat intake and only 5% or so um, of the fat intake is associated with um, uh, saturated fats. And the amount of trans fat uh, that the Chimane consume are, um, is, is, is really negligible. So there is a uh, basically a, a big distinction related to fat intake and uh, respectively in, uh, there's about half as much uh, of the per percentage of, of uh, the diet uh, seen in uh, the Chimane is, uh, consists of fat compared to the United States. So 16 versus 34%. And the amount of protein intake is quite comparable. Uh, now, there is something, uh, a very interesting twist to this story, because even though the Chimane walk a lot, they get in a lot of physical exercise, they seem to be eating a healthier diet than the average American, they also have very high levels of chronic inflammation because they do not have access to traditional, um, uh, to uh, modern medicine. So uh, there is a, there also, there's a high uh, prevalence of um, uh, respiratory inflammatory diseases, uh, tuberculosis, chronic respiratory infections. Uh, the, Chiman, the average Chimane has about uh, four to six uh, uh, intestinal parasite in infections. Uh, so there's uh, throughout their lives, they experience a very high systemic inflammatory load. And inflammation is known to be associated with cardiovascular disease risk. And here are several, uh, two comparisons that are very illuminating. So looking at a C-reactive protein, which uh, as some of you may know, is a, a biomarker of inflammation in the Chimane, we see that there is, uh, as a function of age, uh, there are uh, very, quite high levels of CRP in the blood, in, uh, circulating CRP, uh, whereas in the United States, levels are uh, quite a bit lower, significantly lower. Uh, similarly, uh, if we look at interleukin-6, another a biomarker of inflammation, uh, we see substantial differences, significant differences between the Chimane, who have very high levels of IL-6 uh, measured in picograms per milliliter, so this is in the blood, uh, compared to the United States where levels are a lot lower. So, so this is interesting because uh, despite the benefits uh, to the Chimane lifestyle that uh, I already highlighted, there's also this uh, uh, twist in the story related to inflammation. And 
uh, the inflammatory biomarkers and the, the chronic inflammation that the Chimane exhibits would lead us to posit that there should be detrimental effects on health. And this is uh, one of the uh, key reasons that Chimane are so interesting to, um, to study. If we look at uh, blood pressure and cholesterol in the Chimane, uh, we see uh, a different story. So the average uh, systolic blood pressure is lower on average in the Chimane, so the lower uh, uh, trace uh, here on the bottom, compared to the United States uh, at all ages. Uh, and the difference increases uh, uh, with age as well. So the largest differences are seen in those uh, over 60. Uh, and uh, the levels of cholesterol of the Chimane uh, are uh, significantly, significantly lower than in the United States, where, uh, which are uh, where the pl line above uh, plots the, the average uh, levels by age. So on the one hand, they have very good uh, systolic blood pressure, good cholesterol levels, um, but on the other hand, they have very high infl inflammation. So the question is, uh, how does all that play out in terms of their um, cardiovascular and brain health? So uh, in addition to that, they do not smoke or there is minimal tobacco smoking. And together, all these factors seem to lead to some very good lifetime biomarkers, uh, the low density lipoprotein, so the um, uh, bad cholesterol uh, lifetime measure is about 70 milligrams per deciliter, which is quite good. On average, the blood pressure, their blood pressure is about uh, 116 or 73 uh, millimeters um, uh, mercury. And so, uh, so these are pretty good figures. Uh, their fasting blood sugar is quite good, and their average BMI is, uh, is uh, quite reasonable. And so these um, factors we have posited uh, may lead to minimal uh, coronary artery calcium throughout life, which has been quantified from the CT scans that were acquired in Bolivia. And uh, this is the uh, uh, one, only one part of the story. Uh, the other one is that uh, although they have high infectious loads, high inflammation, parasite infections, as I said, and despite having a very much shortened lifespan, so about 54 years at birth, partly or mostly due to these chronic high inflammatory uh, states, uh, related disorders that uh, make, uh, often causes their death. So they have lower life expectation. They also have uh, delayed atherosclerosis progression. So this is the CAC score by age. Uh, on top is what we have in the United States. Uh, so the, uh, the x-axis is age. Uh, the y-axis is the population percentile and the z-axis is the CAC score. And we see that in, in the United States, uh, shown here above, we have quite a bit um, of CAC even by, by age uh, 55, um, and um, the levels of CAC increase dramatically uh, as a function of population percentile. Whereas in the Chimane, shown here at the bottom, they have uh, very little uh, coronary artery calcium um, throughout their lives. And there's only just minute increases uh, with age. And, uh, and CAC is a um, correlate of atherosclerosis progression. So uh, one, uh, what this reflects is that the Chimane have uh, very little heart disease. Uh, they have a, a very low incidence of uh, 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 cardiac infarctions. Um, they have low, hyper, uh, low prevalence of hyperlipidemia, hypertension, very few cases of heart disease, as I said, very few cases of stroke, um, uh, relatively speaking. Um, and uh, possibly uh, this is due to uh, their levels of physical activity and diet. 
But very interestingly, despite the very low, very high inflammation that they have, they have very low incidence of dementia. And um, there was a paper published by our collaboration in 2017 in The Lancet, uh, where it was reported that the Chimane exhibit the lowest levels of coronary atherosclerosis ever recorded or known to science in any human population. And um, what this uh, study in the Chimane demonstrated was that uh, even preclinical uh, coronary artery disease can be avoided in most people by achieving low uh, bad cholesterol, uh, a healthy blood pressure, uh, low glucose uh, in the healthy range, a healthy BMI, very little tobacco use, and uh, a considerable amount of daily physical activity, despite, again, the presence of very high levels of chronic inflammation uh, related to uh, uh, respiratory tract infections. And what this uh, study by Kaplan et al. in The Lancet um, uh, posited is that in comparison to existing evidence, the Chimane of South America have the lowest prevalence of coronary atherosclerosis despite a high infectious and inflammatory burden. And, and this caveat is, is very important for what I will uh, show you next. Uh, so, based on this data, we hypothesize um, several things on how brain atrophy might re be related to the levels of inflammation in the Chimane. So, we know that brain atrophy rates are associated with uh, vascular disease, with high cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, all of which are very widespread in modern industrialized countries. And we know that low cardiovascular risk is associated with slower brain atrophy. Uh, we also know that systemic inflammation involving the biomarkers I already described predict greater brain atrophy. So in the Chimane, we have, they have low CVD risk, so we might predict slower brain atrophy, but because of the high inflammation, systemically, we might predict greater brain atrophy. So the first hypothesis we formulated was that the populations with lower prevalence of CVD risk factors should uh, exhibit slower brain atrophy and lower risk of associated cognitive decline and dementia. But based on the inflammatory biomarkers, we hypothesize something that predicts the opposite, namely that high uh, inflammatory load uh, should lead to faster brain atrophy. So let's see how that played out. So to test that hypothesis, we had to develop a uh, set of algorithms for, for segmenting uh, the brain and its uh, uh, components from computed tomography, because MRI is not available in that part of the world. It, it's already very difficult to uh, get CT scans from these participants. Uh, it, it would be uh, very logistically challenging to get MRI scans from the Chimane. Uh, and because the, the closest uh, um, uh, city to them only has a, a CT scanner. So my group has had to develop a uh, segmentation algorithm to um, quantify uh, brain volume from CT. So although MRI is, is uh, more suitable than CT for, for brain mapping, uh, especially for uh, quantitating uh, uh, brain morphology. There has been growing CT use throughout the world, especially in the developed world. And for that reason, there's been renewed interest in head CT segmentation. Uh, and uh, CT is also more suitable in cases where MRI is unavailable, like ours, where it's unfeasible, uh, where it's counterindicated uh, for individuals who um, cannot uh, get MRI scans due to pacemakers and so forth or if it's too costly, like in many um, cases in the uh, developing world or even in the developed world. And MRI segmentation uh, tools, as many of you know, are already technically mature, but there's been very little work on CT brain segmentation. And this is the one gap in the uh, technical literature that we have uh, aimed to fill. And um, MRI methods, as we have demonstrated, 
are actually quite amenable to adaptation to, uh, to CT. So we have developed a CT-based brain tissue classification algorithm uh, where we segment the outer layers, uh, so the scalp, uh, the cranium, which is very nicely segmented from CT, as you might expect. Uh, and then once we get to the soft tissue, we have developed a way to separate the gray matter from the white matter from the CSF from CT scans. Here is an example for one subject. And here's the, uh, you can see the ventricular system, which uh, is actually pretty well uh, delineated. You can even see the interthalamic adhesion here a little bit. Uh, you can see the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, uh, and uh, this method uses a, an atlas-based probabilistic labeling tool, uh, which is actually quite standard in the MRI literature uh, and has been used for a long time. And we assign each voxel in, uh, in each CT scan to one of three classes, either gray matter, white matter, and CSS. And we have validated this tool uh, in subjects in the US who received both MRI and CT scans for various uh, clinical purposes. And um, we uh, took MRI as being the gold standard and, uh, and acquired also CTs and segmented their the, the brain from Q1 MRI using pre-surfer software, and then used the CT scans acquired from the same subjects to classify white matter, gray matter, and CSF, to calculate intracranial volume, and to estimate the relative errors in segmentation accuracy, uh, taking MRI as the gold standard. And this was published last year in Frontiers in Neuroinformatics. And what we found is that uh, using the dice coefficient, which is a, a very common um, uh, metric for this kind of comparisons, but also the, the Hausdorff distance, uh, which is a more sophisticated uh, metric, we found that the volume estimation errors uh, for white matter and gray matter uh, were, are actually quite reasonable. So we were able to calibrate our a segmentation method based on MRI to achieve 0% average estimation error for both gray matter, white matter, and CSF with uh, a standard uh, with an error range of about 5%. So that's two, two standard deviations uh, above and below the mean error. 5% uh, for white matter, 4% for gray matter, and about 3% for CSF. And you can see here the comparison between the segmented brain and C uh, CSF, the ventricular system, uh, in MRI versus CT. Uh, MRI, as you can imagine, has a better ability to resolve the gyral structure, but CT isn't too bad at all in terms of finding the total brain volume, which is what we were interested in. And it also does a pretty good job of, uh, of identifying the ventricular system. So we quantified this uh, extensively. We didn't find any bias in volume estimation errors for any of these measures that we used. Uh, they all had a, an approximately normal distribution. Um, and uh, this was also the case for both dice coefficients and Hausdorff distances. Uh, and to compare the Chimane uh, to uh, Westerners, we undertook a, a meta-analysis of 20 years worth of MRI literature, uh, summarizing data over almost 10,000 uh, typically aging adults. This paper was recently published online in neuroinformatics, and we mapped the trajectories of brain volume, gray matter, white matter in CSS in uh, this uh, meta-analytic sample, meta-analyzed sample from um, uh, from the U.S. and Europe, as well as uh, Japan and a few other places, uh, all, all of these being industrialized populations. And we traced the trajectories of these uh, brain measures as a function of age um, after normalization by intracranial volume to remove that confound. So based on those results, we compared the Chimane 
rates of cross-sectional decrease in brain volume uh, with those observed in the U.S. and other industrialized countries. And what we found is that after controlling for sex, uh, there is a cross-sectional decrease in brain volume of about 2.2% per decade in the Chimane compared to about 6.5% per decade in the U.S. And so this is several times a lower uh, rate of atrophy in the Chimane than in the United States suggesting that the rate of brain aging and potentially the, rate, uh, the risk for cognitive impairment and dementia are modulated uh, to a substantial extent by cardiovascular disease incidents because the Chimane, again, have very low cardiovascular disease. So what are the uh, conclusions and significance of this? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the Chimane lose brain volume quite modestly with age, uh, which is consistent with a low burden of cardiovascular disease. And because cardiovascular health is associated with brain atrophy, it is very possible that this low risk of cardiovascular burden, which is uh, potentially mediated by high levels of exercise, by a diet low in trans fats and saturated fats, may have a highly protective effect upon brain health. And very importantly, this suggests that the brain atrophy can be reduced substantially by lifestyles associated with uh, such low cardiovascular disease risk, even in the presence of very high inflammation. And uh, what's very important about this particular study in the Chimane is that it is it provides unique evidence in humans that the effects of systemic inflammation that's very high can be counteracted by healthy diet and exercise. And that is the key uh, reason that the Chimane from the perspective of, of brain health are such a unique um, and very important population because uh, normally in the Western societies we have uh, we might have um, high level, high percentages of, of uh, sedentary lifestyle. We have air pollution, but also because of modern medicine, we also have relatively lower inflammation in the, than in the Chimane. But the Chimane have very high inflammation uh, while having high levels of uh, physical activity and a healthier diet. So this is a very unique environment, a very unique setting to test this hypothesis of whether exercise and diet can have uh, a, a, a protective effect on brain health, even in the presence of systemic inflammation, which is, uh, which is a problem uh, not only in the Chimane, but also in Western societies as well. So this also has implications for prevention. It suggests that a diet of uh, very lean wild game and fish is probably beneficial for health, for brain health and cardiovascular health. And it's probably, it indicates that among the Chimane, um, one can avoid coronary atherosclerosis by, uh, by um, doing a lot of exercise and uh, consuming very low doses of saturated uh, and trans fats. Uh, and, um, a key quote from the original publication is that urbanization and the elimination of a subsistence diet and lifestyle as uh, uh, seen in modern societies might represent a novel risk factors for coronary artery disease. So in conclusion, it's very possible that uh, at least some of the increases in uh, coronary artery disease in diabetes, in uh, dementia, uh, cognitive impairment that we see today in our societies are possibly due to the fact that um, we live in this industrialized, highly urbanized environment with pollution, uh, where we, uh, where many people live a, a sedentary lifestyle and uh, have uh, unhealthy diets. So in conclusion, I would like to thank everyone who has been part of this. This is a 
huge collaboration spanning several, uh, lots of institutions, many countries. Uh, it's a very interdisciplinary team. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone at USC who is part of this, um, as well as uh, at all the other uh, locations in Bolivia, in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my mentor, Tak, tak Finch, here in, uh, at USC in gerontology, and uh, Margie Gatz, who have, uh, uh, with whom I've been collaborating on this project for the past five years. And uh, thank you very much for your interest and attention. Uh, thank you, Jack, for inviting me. And thank you, I'd like to thank the organizers and the NIH for organizing this series um, uh, and this uh, innovation lab. I'd like to thank the Chumane Health and Lifestyle Project team um, and the National Institutes of Health, uh, particularly the National Institute on Aging, which uh, has funded this uh, uh, work under uh, an RF1 grant. Uh, and um, here at the bottom uh, is, is a picture of me in, uh, during our last trip to Bolivia. And here standing next to me is the, the president of the Chumane. So this is, I have to say, the, the first president that I've, of, that I've ever met. So uh, this picture was uh, very nice uh, and uh, uh, unique opportunity for me. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, for your attention, and uh, I would love to hear any questions you might have. Uh, Andre, that was a, a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Really intriguing uh, uh, kind of journey that you took, as well as uh, hearing about the, um, the the issues that present themselves to the Chumane people and just about how their lifestyle seems to kind of uh, be protective for brain health. I like the picture at the end because you were literally rubbing elbows with world leaders in order to conduct this, this study is <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> right, good. Yeah. Um, one of the, 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 a couple of questions which have kind of rolled in, but it was also a question I had um, about this as well, is that physical exercise in particular has been um, associated with all manner of protective uh, brain health or as protective for brain health. And this can, I'm aware of studies in Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, and all, as well as just general psychiatric health. And I'm uh, curious if the Chumane people show reduced rates of these diseases, disorders, and dysfunctions as well. Um, and uh, if you can comment on that. Yes. Uh, so they show extremely low rates of uh, cognitive impairment, very, very low rates of dementia. Uh, several, many, uh, in fact, uh, more than, I think, more than an order of magnitude lower than in the United States. Uh, also, much lower rates of diabetes. Um, as far as Parkinson's disease, uh, so we are, uh, we have, uh, the team has been acquiring cognitive assessments of, uh, of the Chimane, and that data is still under analysis. So, so we haven't um, uh, distinguish between dementia in general and Alzheimer's in particular, per partly because we don't have PET available. But uh, uh, there's very there are very few very low rate of, of Parkinsonism, and uh, it seems that even the cases that just based on preliminary data, even the the cases of dementia that do occur seem to have a, a rather uh, unique presentation which is uh, somewhat different from from the presentation of dementia in industrialized nations mm -hmm. and as far as the mental health uh, I think uh, I have to say I, I, I'm not completely sure I think that the, but I do believe that the profile and prevalence are also uh, quite different from uh, Western society interesting um, one thing that I was curious about as you were talking about the, the just the level of participation, and I realize there's some you know logistical challenges of getting um, your your subjects to um, to the to where the scanner is located and whatnot. Um, what do the what do the Chumane get out of it, right? So they're participating in this. Do, what's the benefit to them? Uh, what motivates them to want to participate in studies like this? Yes, uh, the team has been uh, 
very involved with the Chumane for 20 years. Uh, the team has developed a, a very a good working relationship with them. Uh, they, every time they come over to Trinidad for the scans, for these uh, uh, research scans, they also uh, get physical exams and treatments for uh, whatever uh, medical conditions they might have. Uh, they also uh, receive some um, supplies that is useful to them in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, so they, they do uh, uh, have some artisanal, um, uh, well, they, so, so there is some, uh, they knit, they sew, so there's various forms of uh, uh, ways that we, that the team can assist the, the Chimane while preserving their way of life. So, they, so there's uh, uh, supplies like that that are provided. So there's various ways like that, but the, I think the, the primary incentive is um, is the fact that they they receive some medical uh, uh, attention and, and treatment uh, um, and follow up uh, as a result of this project. Right. And are, are you getting full genome sequences with uh, these um, with the Chumane as well? There is. Um, I know that. So I'm not the genome data. We're just starting to look at in more detail, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we are getting. I think I think it is uh, full genome sequencing. Uh, if uh, and uh, there is definitely uh, genotyping at a, at a very large number of SNPs. Uh, if 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 full genome sequencing is not done, and do do the Chumane suffer from any particular prevalence of genetic disorders? Uh, that does not seem to be the case. Uh, but again, we have not analyzed. Uh, the genetic data in very much detail yet. One interesting uh, potential finding that's very preliminary is that uh, their sequencing has confirmed that they are quite genetically distant from, so there's been very little admixture between them and surrounding indigenous populations. Um, and there's there's also been little uh, genetic ad admixture with the uh, that is of uh, with individuals of European descent. So there's all, uh, so there's less than less than ten percent, or maybe five, or even less, are uh, have any uh, genetic contributions from um, from uh, in, uh, from previous uh, interaction with European Europeans or persons with of European descent. Fantastic. Um, what about, uh, are, are there any implications from what you're learning about from the Chumane that can directly affect us here in the U.S. and in, you know, kind of more modern societies around the world that, you know, you kind of mentioned healthy eating and whatnot. Um, on the other hand, I've probably been not eating healthy for, oh, 50 years or so. Is it too late for me, unlike the Chumane who presumably spend their lifetime doing it um, and get to, to get the benefits of it? Is it, it? is it something that one can arrest any <laughs> downward slide into dementia? Uh, yeah, so definitely even interventions at a later age can be beneficial. Uh, for example, uh, and this is not based on data that I have shown, but uh, there's there's a lot of interest now in epigenetic clocks, for example, in uh, methylation clocks that uh, um, quantify the uh, extent of DNA methylation and allow us to estimate biological age uh, of tissues of uh, individuals based on the extent of DNA methylation and um, and what, what some of those studies have shown is that the changes in, in lifestyle uh, can lead to a lower rate of uh, DNA methylation, which translates into a slowing down of the aging process in various, uh, various tissues and, and cell, cell type lineages. Um, so, so that's, but that's coming from outside this particular work. Uh, from the Chimane, uh, what we do know is that, uh, what we have found is that um, despite the fact that 
in the United States and in other Western societies, we have very high rates of uh, inflammation, chronic inflammation, especially at the older ages, uh, because of, uh, of diet or uh, air pollution or a sedentary lifestyle, um, even and even causes of other inflammation that so that cannot necessarily be removed. So, for example, air pollution uh, for many people is not a, a factor that can be uh, easily addressed. Uh, the uh, the changes in the diet and changes in um, in diet, in uh, exercise, can tremendously assist with creating a protective effect against the inf pro-inflammatory uh, factors that are damaging to health. And I think that's the one of the key uh, reasons that the Chimane are so interesting to study is because this is a very unique population where, on the one hand, you have high exercise uh, very uh, relatively healthy of diet, but on the other hand, also a very uh, high inflammatory load. And yet the brain atrophy and the brain um, uh, shrinking pro profiles as a function of age are very much slower than in, um, in the United States. So that seems to indicate that there is some major protective effect associated with exercise and diet, and uh, to the extent that these relationships are causal in the Chimane, uh, that can also uh, uh, prevent and, and lower the rates of uh, cognitive decline and dementia. What are the next studies that one hopes to do with uh, the Chimane and uh, that uh, can help kind of answer some of the outstanding questions that you have left? Uh, so for the moment, the, uh, the the, our campaigns are, have been paused because of the pandemic. Interestingly enough, um, although the, the COVID virus has reached Bolivia and, and Trinidad and the Chimane villages, uh, the, uh, very, very few, there have been very, very few deaths among the Chimane from the COVID virus. Uh, which is, again, very surprising because they have a very high inflammatory load, uh, which should translate into a high risk. Um, but they seem, uh, and this is something we're, we're studying now, we, we only have uh, some epidemiological data that's very preliminary at the moment, but it, it's going to be very interesting to look at why um, the, uh, the percentage of, of COVID survivors um, is so high relative to the rates of infection and also why the most of the symptoms in uh, those who do get COVID um, are so much milder than, than in uh, countries like our own and in Europe. Uh, so that's something that we have received funding from the NIH to study uh, soon. Uh, as soon as we can resume our campaigns, we also plan to uh, re-scan the Chimane, uh, their brains, to turn this into a longitudinal study rather than a cross-sectional study. So we're interested now in, in, in quantifying um, brain aging uh, in a longitudinal design and looking at all the other inflammatory factors and, and other uh, variables of interest in a longitudinal um, Settings, uh, so that's going to be a major effort going forward, uh, and and possibly uh, we could even look at uh, some methylation clocks and uh, uh, and look at changes in the rate of a of biological aging, and and so um, that I imagine that's going to keep us quite busy for the next five or five to ten years. Well, it's a fascinating study. It's a really fantastic opportunity to understand how brain aging affects this unique population and kind of the implications that that and their lifestyle has for our own. Um, fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Irmia, for sharing that with us. Um, with that, I think we're uh, kind of at our time. I want to thank Dr. Irmia from the University of Southern California for sharing his work with us. I want to thank uh, our, all the people who uh, joined us today, both on uh, our um, Innovation Lab participants on Zoom and everybody out on YouTube. Um, with that, thank you very much. And thank you once again, Dr. Irmia. 
Thank you for having me.